very good morning and warm welcome to online analysis here post project teaching program on zoom platform sponsored by akula and hosted by a1 logics and aired by anasisia tv today we are having two important topics i can say it is a rare topic in pediatric anesthesia that is anesthesia for conjoint twins and anesthesia for genetic muscle disorders for that we have two eminent scholars on our online platform dr swarna and dr kaushik i welcome both to online anesthesia platform the first speaker dr swarna is working as a professor of anesthesia in government medical college kolikot kerala she is past president of isa calicut city branch she has received tamil nadu tn ja and sansuri memorial travel grant for best paper and her area of interest is difficult airway acute pain management pediatric anesthesia and regional anesthesia she has many national and international publications over to you madam thank you good morning to all at the outset let me thank dr edward johnson for uh, inviting me for this uh, for online post graduate uh, teaching program uh, this is a pediatric uh, topic session i think and it's a rare topic so what topic given for me today is anesthesia for conjoint twins anesthesia for conjoint twin is an enormous challenge to us not but because we need to care two tiny kids at the same time because of the concerns of conjoint in physiology like pro circulation organ sharing and the long marathon twin separation surgery with the massive fluid shift and blood loss so we are very much worried about this separation surgery and it's a very rare challenging surgery also so let us let me start from basics conjoint twins are identical twins whose bodies are joined in utero it's a very rare phenomenon with a uh, reported incidence of 1 in 50000 to 1 in 2 lakh births and higher incidence is reported from southwest asia and africa they are also called as miracle babies they are always monozygotic monochorionic and monoamniotic and always of the same sex there is some female pr predominance almost 75% or 3 to 1 ratio and of this almost 40% are still born and of those born only 25% of them will live long enough to become candidates for separation surgery so we it's a rare opportunity to give anesthesia for a conjoint in separation surgery you may be aware of this famous conjoint twins bunger twins that is chang and eng bunger so famous they were born in siam that is now the thailand in 1811 they were uh, born as a conjoint twins joined at the sivi sternum they were share your slides madam share your slides share your slides i'm sure isn't isn't the slides showing not not sure okay what happened you share it again how is it possible now it's happened uh, not yet not yet wasn't it uh, sharing it ma'am come back to zoom and click on the share screen ma'am now your ppt is open no in the screen you can see your ppt yeah, yeah come back to zoom i mean r to tab i don't know what happened in between is yes. it uh, yes yeah. yes ma'am Visible. Okay, I'm very sorry. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Okay, so some part of the history, you may be aware of these famous pair of conjoint twins, known as Bunger twins. That is Chang and Eng Bunger. They were born joined at the Sivi sternum. They were they were born in the Siam. That is uh, this, now it's a part of Thailand in 1811. They were popularly known as Siamese twin, and this term Siamese twin has become synonymous with conjoint twins. some uh, embryological aspect 
there are two conflicting theories of this origin fission or fusion in fission it uh, dictates that there is an incomplete division of fertilized egg after the 11th day whereas in fusion it says the fertilized egg completely separates but the stem cells search for similar stem cells in the other twin and the similar cells become fused together so the uh, embryos become fused at some parts fetuses become uh, joined at some part that is similar cells get fused together and the part which is joining the two twins is used to classify these conjoined twins and the suffix used is a greek word pagos which means that which is fixed so the part of the body which is uniting the two twins is used to used to classify and uh, give a uh, name the conjoined twin so there are different names depending upon the type body part which is uh, uniting the two twins that is one is the thoracopagus whereas the upper thorax of the two twins are united of the conjoined twin 35 to 40 percentage of uh, conjoined twins are thoracopagus and when there is an abdominal fusion it is called omphalopagus it which comes around 30 to 35 percentage and ischiopagus and pyopagus which comprises 6 to 19 percentage where fusion is at the level of the pelvis or a sacrum others are the rare forms like uh, craniopagus where skull are fused it comes around 2 percentage and there is when there is the lateral fusion of the lower half of body it called parapagus and the fusion is at the back it is called rachipagus and yet another altogether different version is the parasitic twin where the twins are asymmetrical they are called parasitic twin the thoracopagus is the commonest that is 35 30 35 to 40% of all the conjoined twin where the upper thorax of the twins are fused so heart is always involved so it carries a high mortality this picture is the uh, post mortem angiography of a conjoined uh, which shows the conjoined heart it carries a very high mortality sometimes thoraco omphalopagus that is combined union of the thorax as well as the abdomen upper chest to abdominal fusion seen this also shares a, a heart usually and liver also sometimes another is the omphalopagus in which only the abdominal union occurs this comes around 30 to 35 percentage in this heart is not at all involved but liver and other gi tracts are usually involved craniopagus though different it is very important the skull is fused at either at the top or the back but the fusion never occurs at the face or at the base of the skull it never at the uh, face or a base of skull here the airway management is quite challenging and there is high chance for air embolism and there is massive blood loss and uh, the this kind of uh, craniopagus twins are often inseparable and because there is brain involvement there is a high risk of brain damage so or, or mostly becomes inseparable also ischiopagus and pyopagus uh, incidence is 6 to 19 percentage of all conjoined twins where the fusion is at the pelvis or sacrum so usually genito urinary and intestinal tracts are involved and sometimes spinal cord anomalies are also get and uh, can be uh, have uh, limb anomalies also but the survival rate is very high because the major organs are not at all shared so survival rate is high with ischiopagus and pyopagus yet another different variety is the parasitic twin where it is the heteropagus twin or asymmetrical twinning here one twin is smaller and the it is less formed also and that depends for survival of the a yeah, normal twin yet another different version is the fetus in fetus here an imperfect fetus is contained completely within the body of the twin so parasitic twin and fetus in fetus are yet another different varieties of twins yeah, conjoined twins the further classification of conjoining uh, twinning is de uh, depending upon the number of limbs present depending upon the number of upper limbs there is two arms three arms four arms it is named as dibrachius tribrachius or tetrabrachius depending upon the number of lower legs it is bipus tripus or tetrapus 
So the number of limbs present also used to subclassify the conjoint twins. Some of the perinatal considerations: the conjoint twinning can be diagnosed in the uh, first trimester itself by radiological imaging. The earlier diagnosis is essential and very important to identify the anomalies. You can predict prognosis and plan the obstetric management. And the cardiac and neurological involvement is determines the outcome. Once you have diagnosed perinatally, I mean, prenatally, you can give counseling to the family, and they should come to a kind of a decision. Sometimes the complex conjoining uh, maybe uh, maybe may not be in uh, uh, the, the twins may not live properly. So you should consider termination in such complex conjoining. So earlier the diagnosis better because you can give proper counseling to the family so that they can arrive to a better decision so that you they can consider termination if the conjoining is complex. There is religious, moral, ethical, and legal implications also because birth of an in handicapped child is an immense burden to all parents. And sometimes, if one of the twin will not survive, separation is justified to provide life of the other twin. And the survival is determined by the pre-morbid condition of the twins. So, and parents have every right to refuse a separation also. And the laws in the uh, in a country and their religious and other beliefs of the parents also matters. So, it is very complicated issue the separation or the birth of a conjoint twin. So anesthesia for conjointing is an enormous challenge, not because you need to give care to the two tiny patients at the same time. The underlying uh, conjointing physiology of uh, amount of cross circulation and the amount of organ shared and the long marathon separation surgery with the massive fluid shift and uh, blood loss are the main challenges in the surgery. The anesthesia service to conjointing twins are not just for the separation surgery. We get an ample uh, opportunity to give offer our service to these conjointing, starting from the obstetric anesthesia service to the mother and exit procedures, resuscitation of the newborn, airway management, vascular access, ICU management, and for uh, anesthesia service to many investigative procedures or examination under anesthesia of the twins, and uh, placement of tissue expanders, and so sometimes the uh, twins may need some emergency surgery, emergency separation, or for the definitive separation. And our service is not stopping just at the separation surgery. Even after separation also, they may come for reconstruction and rehabilitation procedures, even for chronic pain syndrome. So anesthesia services to conjoint twins, we get and, uh, so many opportunities. It is not just for separation surgery. But my uh, topic is, uh, my, my talk will be mainly concerning about the separation surgery. The survival and prognosis is uh, depending upon the twinning, the type of the twins. The potential for separation and uh, long-term survival depends on the, where the actual attachment between the twins and the degree of major organs shared and the circulatory sharing, depending upon the amount of closed circulation and in presence of other congenital anomalies. All these will uh, uh, mainly dictate the long-term survival. And the twin separation surgery carries a high mortality rate of almost 50%. So the main concerns in the separation surgery are the, the view require a thorough preoperative evaluation and planning, and you require multidisciplinary team approach and because the surgery is a long marathon surgery with a massive fluid shift and blood loss, you require vigilant monitoring and intensive post-operative care also. So these are the main concerns in a, a conjoint in separation surgery. So preoperative evaluation should be thorough and well-planned. The shared organs and body parts should be considered. Every organ system needs thorough evaluation preoperatively. The anomaly, some of the anomalies may preclude the survival or lead to major handicap, which may interfere the acceptable life that she need to be determined. Some of the cardiac and neurological involvement will prevent separation because the twins may not live after separation. So cardiac and neurological anomalies are the most important which prevent separation of the twinning. 
the amount of cross circulation is very important because the the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic mix of the drugs are inconsistent in presence of cross circulation the because the drugs given to one pill will have unexpected effect in the other pill because some of the iv administered drug will cross to over to the second twin so the estimation of the cross circulation how much there is cross circulation will help to calculate the drug dosage and fluid replacement intraoperatively so estimation can be done by radio isotope or angiographic imaging that is helpful to estimate the percentage of cardiac output that is exchange between the twins clinically you can estimate this uh, presence of cross circulation by giving anticholinergic drug to one twin intravenously and noting the effect in the other child so when do you time the separation surgery ideally it is not in the neonatal period the it is the best time is between 4 to 11 months and the twins are at least uh, 8 kg weight total weight but sometimes emergency separation may be required as indicated in when the condition of the one twin threatens the survival of the other as with the complex congenital heart disease or uh, sepsis sepsis syndrome or when one twin is incompatible with the life as with anencephaly or ek cardiac and the other twin has a high chance for survival and when there is damage to the connecting grid as in omphalopagus so these are the indications for an emergency separation that is condition of one twin threatens the survival of the other or one twin is incompatible with the uh, survival or if there is connecting uh, bridge is damaged otherwise the separation is scheduled in the later half of the infancy that is the 4 to 11 months or and the babies are at least 8 kg weight you need a thorough preoperative planning with a multidisciplinary team the multidisciplinary team should involve all those involved in the perioperative management of this twins this include the anesthesiology team pediatric surgeons all the surgical specialties involved in the uh, surgical separation intensivists nurses technicians and all other supporting staff and you should conduct preoperative meetings multiple preoperative meetings to formulate a thorough perioperative planning and uh, the you can place uh, tissue expanders the surgeon will place the tissue expanders to recruit skin for uh, closure so multiple tissue expander placement may be required preoperatively in the uh, multiple preoperative me meetings with the multidisciplinary team you should discuss all the investigations and imagings and the you should come to a conclusion about the order in which their different surgical specialties operate and the plan position if any change in the position intraoperatively that has to be discussed and the location of the intravenous and arterial lines and all the monitors should be discussed discussed and also any anticipated problems and uh, what postoperative care is required for that uh, child everything should be discussed in the preoperative meetings and should come to a conclusion and in the meeting you should assign specific task to each member there should be one team leader you should be who should assign specific task to each member in the multidisciplinary team and you can even conduct preoperative simulation and such rehearsals will identify the potential stumbling blocks that will optimize the anesthesia and surgical flow and will ensure needed equipments and supplies this will uh, these such uh, preoperative meetings and simulation will promote the leadership and communication also so that that will ensure a safe and effective patient care without complications or delays so there are doll models even for simulation and for the separation preoperatively so you can the, this will uh, point out any stumbling blocks intraoperatively whether any intravenous line is getting uh, dislodged so the position change everything you can uh, do the rehearsal such rehearsals in the ot itself preoperatively and the arrangement in the ot for separation surgery should be very carefully done there should be one ot table initially with uh, all other equipments machine everything should be duplicated two machine two monitoring system uh, syringe pumps uh, warm up devices drug cart everything should be duplicated initially single table thereafter once the separation is over you require two tables for the reconstruction of the each twin and the arrangement of the ot should be it to suit the type of the conjoint twin 
because for craniopagus and cephalopagus, the machine should be on either side, on the side. Whereas for these uh, issue pegus and uh, pyopegus, on a, the machine should be on either end of the table. So the OT should be arranged to suit the type of the conjunctive. So the main anesthetic concerns are the, depending on the conjoined in physiology because the, the amount of cross circulation organ sharing, the, the marathon surgery with the massive fluid shift uh, because there is large loss of blood and components and the rapid replenishment is required. The long hours of uh, anesthesia in a two tiny pediatric subject simultaneously and the challenging airway and uh, challenges in the thermoregulation also. So the, you need an anesthesia team with a one team leader and two lead anesthesiologists for each team. And you should have trainees and other supporting staff and technicians. The anesthesia plan should be uh, carefully planned with the uh, pre-op rehearsals as required. And the weight of the conjoint in is uh, the total weight is taken. And if the twins appear equal, you can half the combined weight to, for the drug calculation. Other, otherwise, if they are asymmetrical, depending upon the approximate weight. And the color coding is very important. The colored stickers are used to the or, place on the twins' wrist and files, as well as on the machine, tubings, monitors, lines, syringes, everything should be color coded. It may extend even up to the surgical and anesthesia team also, and it should be used throughout the perioperative period. Color coding is very important because it prevents administering wrong drug or wrong agent to the twin. Even it prevents doing the wrong surgery in a wrong twin. So color coding is very important in the conjoint separation surgery. Pre-medication, the uh, uh, neonatal period, the separation anxiety is not an issue because the babies may be hospitalized from birth. Older infants, if required, may you can give oral metasolum or chloral hydrate as required. Another challenging aspect is the venous access because the babies are administered, I mean, uh, hospitalized from birth itself. So long hospitalization make the venous access very challenging. And adequate vascular access is a must for uh, uh, separation surgery because you need to transfuse large amounts of fluids and shift uh, fluids and uh, blood. The induction of the twins has to be done sequentially, either inhalation or intravenous. It is a potentially difficult airway, especially in the cephalopagus and the cream, you know, thoraco, omphalope, thoracopagus. So intubation without muscle relaxant in the first in is uh, done due to fear of the premature weakness in the second in because of the cross circulation. So you can use sevoflurane or uh, inhalation induction or IV ketamine and lignocaine spray to the mouth can be done. If there is no airway issue and hemodynamically stable and without any cross circulation, you can do any go for any induction agent. Airway management is very challenging in conjointin because the difficult airway is uh, anticipated in thoraco, omphalopagus, and craniopagus. The challenges are mainly due to the positioning issues because access to mouth and larynx is quite difficult. And sometimes the endotracheal tube may get caught at the subglottis. And you need to support the uh, ventilation in the second twin also because of the cross circulation. So all this makes airway management quite challenging. In the thoraca omphalopagus, you can see the there is hyperextension of the neck. There is inability to position each twin uh, supine, and access to mouth is dif difficult because their faces are so close. You can see. So the uh, airway management is highly challenging in the uh, thoraca omphalopagus and craniopagus. So you, you have to do sequential induction intubation. FOB, laryngoscope, our unique positioning techniques all can be used to help the airway management. And sometimes, the, as I said, the endotracheal tube may get caught at the subglottis. Then you have to rotate the endotracheal tube 180 degree as it passes through the glottis to avoid uh, getting caught at the subglottic level. And the type of endotracheal tube, whether reinforced or ordinary, or what root, nasal or oral, that depends on determined by the type of conjunction. In some of the uh, conjunction, the nasal intubation is preferred because fixing of the nasal intubation may be easier. So sequential induction intubation, and uh, you can use any technique, fiber optic or a wheel laryngoscope, unique positioning technique to uh, the, for the airway management.
Maintenance should be done with a saver fluoride one to two percentage with the oxygen, air, and fentanyl. Ventilation should be synchronized to improve the quality. Whether diaphragm is involved or whether diaphragm will be affected by the surgery is very important. And the lung compliance is also mostly affected. You usually see in areas of consolidation and uh, atelectasis. So ventilation should be synchronous and the diaphragmatic involvement is very important in the ventilation. Another important aspect is the positioning. The positioning, it should be discussed in the preoperative planning itself. Ensure ample space for all staff in the crowded OT around the two tiny patients. In drought, change in the position is yet another risky aspect because it may uh, cause dislodgement of the endotracheal tube or the vascular axis. So it has to be done very carefully. Any change in the position intraoperatively. And as far as possible, monitors and machines should be kept on the same side of the twin. An impact of moving tables apart after the separation should be borne in mind. So position change intraoperatively is risky because of the risk of dislodgement of the endotracheal tube and vascular axis. Fluid and blood management is yet another important aspect of twin separation surgery. So you require large bore IV axis and central venous line. The incision is extensive and there is a long operation time which causes massive third space loss and blood loss. So loss from almost uh, half to more than five times the estimated loss is uh, seen. So for maintenance, you can go for a balanced crystalloid solution at a rate of 15 ml per kg per hour. Early use of colloids and blood products are better. You can consider albumin. And the fluid management should be guided by the IVP, CVP, and urine output. And the blood and covenant should be replaced as required. And you can use uh, point of care monitoring of the coagulation. And vasopressor infusion for circulatory support may be required um, earlier. Extensive loss during pelvis, pelvic osteotomy is seen with the issue in pyopagus. And uh, serial blood gas estimation, electrolytes, blood sugar, and calcium estimation is required. And correct any uh, blood gas anomalies or electrolyte abnormalities, and uh, sometimes calcium replenishment may be required. Thermoregulation is also very important. Maintaining normothermia is quite challenging because it's an extensive surgery, long incision, large exposed surface area. So there is every opportunity to heat loss. So prevent heat loss by any measures like plastic drapes, padded bandage around the exposed limbs, warm fluids and blood, forced air warmer. So take any measures to prevent heat loss and uh, maintaining thermo, uh, normothermia is very important. In the reconstructive phase, once the babies are separated, the baby should be uh, 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 taken to the two tables for the reconstructive phase. So the further reconstruction and closure is done during this reconstructive phase in two separate tables with the two separate teams. And once the separation is, I mean, once the reconstruction is over and the closure is done, postoperative care is in the postoperative intensive care unit and where they require careful postoperative monitoring. Of course, adequate analgesia is obligatory. Monitoring should be continued for any ongoing blood loss, electrolyte imbalance, hypoxia, acidosis, hypothermia, or any organ dysfunction. And the fluid management should be done in a, by a hourly monitoring and a replacement as needed. The, some of the early postoperative problems include, include uh, the sequels of blood transfusion, massive transfusion, long hours of surgery, and tight skin closure. Many a time, the primary closure will be very difficult because of the tight closure, which may affect the underlying organ function. So sometimes the incision may be kept open, part of it may be kept open and uh, covered later on. The uh, common cause of mortality are the cardiovascular and respiratory problems. Diaphragmatic dysfunction and uh, sternal chest wall insufficiency are also important. And both twins should be nursed in the same postoperative room to prevent separation anxiety. And the multidisciplinary team approach should be continued in the postoperative care also. Because these children will require definitely require extensive rehabilitation and reconstructive surgery postoperatively. 
and many sittings of reconstructive surgery may be required. So the uh, multidisciplinary team approach should be continued in the post-operative care also. And survival rate is highly variable depending upon the type of conjoining. Coming to our experience with the separation surgery, we were for fortunate to have one experience with the conjoined separation surgery in 2015, which uh, we had reported in the Indian Journal of Anesthesia. It was a issue of Pegasus tetrapus twin. The antenatal diagnosis was missed and the twins were born outside and uh, referred to our center for expert management. Baby in this issue of Pegasus tetrapus twin, the baby A was having normal facies and cardiorespiratory system. Whereas the uh, second twin baby B was having abnormal facies, multiple congenital anomalies like cleft lip, cleft palate, a large uh, cystic hygroma, non-aerated lung, univendricular heart. And there was associated anorectal and urogenital abnormalities also. So baby B was considered as parasitic and non-salvageable. So early separation was required to save baby B. So the parents were given uh, a full explanation and thorough psychological counseling and the concern were taken for separation for the two twins to save baby A because baby A had a high chance for survival. So early separation in the neonatal period itself was planned and the surgery was done on the postnatal day 13. So a multidisciplinary team was formed with uh, all the uh, anesthesia team, surgical specialties and the other uh, nursing and supporting staff and uh, preoperative meetings and meticulous planning of the surgery and the postoperative care was done. The anesthetic management, we have kept ready the two sets of equipments, machines, monitors, um, all the equipments were duplicated. The, apart from the baseline monitors, we used uh, central venous line, temperature, urine output, and the cross circulation was confirmed clinically on table by giving the an atropine to the twin A, and which uh, shows a rise in the heart rate in the twin B. Intravenous induction with the phenylene and thiopinone so sodium was done to the twin A and intubated under uh, intubated. And uh, laryngeal structures of the twin B was not identified with the subsequent intubation attempt. So the uh, baby B was given a supplemental oxygen through nasal catheters for fear of any shunting. So only baby A could be intubated. Laryngeal structures of the baby B was not identified, but it was supplemented oxygen to prevent any shunting. The separation surgery was done by the multidisciplinary team. They included the pediatric surgeons, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons and other supporting staff. Initially, the vascular, bladder and ureteric separation was performed. Later on, vertebrotomy at the level of uh, lower lumbar spinal level is done and the parasitic child was separated. And the lower limb of the parasitic child that was still attached to the baby A was disarticulated and the baby A was separated completely and uh, uh, complete skin closure was possible in the primary closure itself. There were massive fluid and blood loss, which was monitored and replaced. Fresh whole blood and uh, blood products like uh, fresh frozen plasma and uh, platelet concentrate was used. Serial blood gas, electrolyte, blood sugar, hemoglobin and coagulation monitoring was done. And postoperatively, the baby was uh, ventilated in the intensive care unit with all intensive monitoring. And the baby could be uh, safely extubated after 24, of, uh, 24 hours of ventilation in the ICU. And the perioperative period was uneventful for the, uh, the live baby. To summarize, anesthesia for, for conjoint and separation is a highly challenging and demanding surgery, though it is a rare opportunity. You need a thorough preoperative evaluation and a planning with a multidisciplinary team approach with the multiple preoperative meetings. It's a long duration surgery with a massive blood loss and fluid shift. So you require vigilant monitoring and intensive postoperative care. And the survival rate is highly variable depending upon the type of conjoin conjoining. To conclude, multidisciplinary teamwork with meticulous planning is the cornerstone of successful management of conjoined and separation surgery. Thank you. Thank and you, madam. These are some of my references.
thank you thank you very much madam you have covered the theory part and i have shared your experience also it will be more useful for the post graduates and the consultants since it is a rare surgery and it is not a day to day uh, anesthesia the questions are also less so i will take two or three questions madam madam you have said uh, there is a cross circulation is assessed by giving atropine suppose the cross circulation is not there how will you calculate the calculation suppose the cross circulation is there how will you calculate the drug calculation then the depending upon the bed, there are many reports of uh, uh, the case reports of the conjoining separation without any cross circulation also because if there is no if there is radiological imaging in the bed, if you can preoperatively calculate the cross circulation by the imaging methods also angiographic and radio isotope scanning also and uh, by clinically also are they if there is no cross circulation at all you have to uh, give the drugs as per the weight the baby there is no problem in uh, giving the drugs as normally there are many reports in the uh, literature about the conjoint separation without any having no cross circulation at all but in our child we noted a rise in heart rate with the atropization of the first baby so you have to give different doses for different a and b yes they, if they are symmetrical if they are yeah you have to give separate if they are symmetrical half of the baby weight and different dose for the baby n and, and baby b okay so regarding its ventilatory settings it also differs between the two yes yeah, yes that also different settings different different machines different ventilators and there is one question how to measure the weight of each baby separately yeah that is that is very difficult uh, i already said if they appear symmetrical you have can half the weight otherwise it is difficult uh, thank you very much madam i have seen your presentation in the ija so i thought you are the right person to talk about the your experience and the theory thank you very much madam thank you thank you thank you sir we will move on to the second topic go six sir uh first i want to introduce dr kausik sir <coughs> i invite kausik sir to online online analysis platform he needs no introduction for post graduates because he is the author of best seller that is anesthesia review published by ji brothers presently working as a consultant pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist in gk nam hospital kaimtur he is a co editor of ayatta echo library and he is going to deliver a tough le lecture on the anesthesia for genetic muscle disorders openly i say no one can speak on this topic unless they have a depth of knowledge dr kausik is the right person with abundant of knowledge so he can the right person he is the right person to talk about this topic what is sir so thank you so much for a lovely introduction i'm humbled by the introduction and to all my uh, 40 odd participants who have logged in to the meeting a very good morning uh, i'll be talking to you today about anesthesia for genetic muscular disorders uh, i work at gknm hospital as a pediatric cardiac anesthetist in coimbatore <coughs> are my slides visible sir yes sir it's visible okay sir more than 200 are watching in youtube also yes okay. sir a very good morning very good morning to all uh, on second sir so uh, genetic muscular disorders as we all know are a very rare uh, subset of disorders with a incidence of around uh, 1 in 10000 to 1 in 1 lakh life births so as science medical science has improved so has the progress in treatment of these conditions which has in turn increased the survival and so we will be uh, seeing more and more of these patients as we uh, move on and uh, uh, regardless all of these patients pose a very huge anesthetic uh, challenge and uh, there are more than 30 different genetic muscular disorders and we should be looking at a few prominent of these in the upcoming slides if i were you i definitely commit the points which i have uh, highlighted in yellow to memory so before we jump on to uh, muscular disorders we must know i mean uh, whenever you talk of muscular disorders there are certain uh, common diseases which pop up in your mind like uh, multiple sclerosis like myasthenia gravis like guillain barre's uh, syndrome 
muscular dystrophies. So we need to find a way to classify these diseases. So you have uh, neurological disorders which lead to secondary muscular insult. You have muscular disorders which arise at the neuromuscular junction. And finally, you have isolated muscular disorders. And this is where we're going to concentrate, that is isolated muscular disorders. And so that excludes all the other uh, disorders. And this is a very important slide, if you can uh, uh, note it. So there are different types of uh, genetic muscular disorders. Uh, we could classify them as muscular dystrophies, wherein there is a degenerative disease of the muscle. We can uh, classify them into myotonias, wherein there is a defective tone of the muscles. So the muscle has a tough time going into the relaxation phase after contracting. You have metabolic myopathies, wherein there is an accumulation of abnormal proteins in the sarcoplasm of the muscle. Mitochondrial myopathies, wherein the mitochondria are affected within the skeletal muscle, and this would lead to a lack of ATP production. And finally, malignant hyperthermia, which occurs following anesthetic exposure. And uh, this itself is a very vast topic. And so therefore, it falls beyond the purview of this presentation. So we should look at muscular dystrophies first. Uh, so uh, this slide depicts the few uh, prominent types of muscular dystrophy. So they can be classified based upon the type of inheritance into X-linked dystrophies, autosomal recessive dystrophies, and autosomal dominant dystrophies. And the most common ones, that is the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and Becker's dystrophy, happen to be X-linked dystrophies. So uh, this depicts a child with a Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And imagine if you had to anesthetize just this child, what would be your anesthetic plan? And for that, we need to know what exactly happens in these muscular dystrophies. So Duchenne's muscular dystrophy <clears throat> is basically nothing. Uh, it's called pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy. That is a fibro fatty infiltration of muscles. And so it's nothing but a pumped up sponge pop. There is nothing but sponge inside. So even though the child initially tends to look very hypertrophied, all his muscles are hypertrophied. All of these are nothing but a fibro fatty infiltration of your muscles. So this happens to be the most common type of hereditary muscular dystrophy with an incidence of around one in 3,500 life births. Most severe type of muscular dystrophy. So that is something which we need to remember. So this occurs early and it progresses very rapidly. And most often the child is wheelchair bound by around 10 to 15 years of age. So the inheritance, as we said earlier, is X-linked recessive. And this occurs because there is a mutation in the XP21 region. And uh, this region codes for dystrophin proteins. So the mutation causes an absence of uh, dystrophin in the muscle. This in turn leads to muscular degeneration. And as we discussed earlier, there is a fibro fatty infiltration of all your muscles, which leads to a loss of function. So because it is X-linked recessive, it occurs only in males and the females tend to be carriers. However, patients, female patients with Turner syndrome may end up uh, showing uh, symptoms of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So family positive history is seen in almost 90% of the cases. So what happens as a result of this abnormal dystrophin? So dystrophin as a normal protein is important because it interacts with actin. And this in turn interacts with the laminin in extracellular matrix. And this is what leads to a stable sarcolemal membrane. So when you have a mutant dystrophin, the interaction with laminin is affected. And this, it would, uh, this in turn would lead to a very leaky sarcolemal membrane. So what happens is the intracellular components start leaking out. And this in turn leads to an elevated serum CPKMB levels. So the increased sarcolemal permeability again leads to macrophage infiltr uh, infiltration of your dead cell membrane units. And this would cause a fibro fatty infiltration of the dead cell tissue. So this is briefly what happens with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So the progression, as we said, is very rapid. It is rarely symptomatic at birth and it presents it uh, usually around two to five year old boys. There is an early proximal weakness, which is uh, shown by, uh, which, which mainly affects the gluteal muscles and the shoulder girdle. The distal muscle function is usually well preserved until later stages. So there is no impairment in eating or writing or functions which involve your fine motor functions. So a child <clears throat> usually is wheelchair bound by around eight to 10 years of age. 
and by the age of 20 to 25 years the respiratory muscles get affected and the child is usually consumed by either congestive cardiac failure or by pneumonia so this is a nice slide which shows the progression of the disease so as we see here uh, at two years he's uh, pseudo hypertrophic and at eight years they typically tend to develop a lumbar lordotic stance when they stand up and this lumbar lordosis disappears when they sit down and usually by around 10 to 15 years, these children are wheelchair bound. So the early features, most, com most prominent of these would be a waddling gait, like we see the woman walking here. And uh, imagine if somebody were to walk like this, it obviously would lead to frequent falling. There is a difficulty climbing stairs. And along with this, you have large firm uh, calf muscles because of your pseudo hypertrophy. And what is very pathognomonic is your Gower's sign which uh, usually, I mean, it's uh, rare to uh, see this uh, sign in patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, but whenever you see this, it is more or less diagnostic. So when person stands up from the floor, after he, I mean, from the sitting position, it's usually with the assistance of the upper limbs, he holds his, hand, uh, he holds his limbs and then his hips, and then finally he's able to stand up. So this is your Gower sign. So late features usually tend to appear beyond five years of age, so initially, as we saw, there is a lordotic stance and the child loses ambulation by around 10 years of age. And once he loses ambulation, he slowly starts developing kyphoscoliosis. And because of the loss of ambulation, uh, there is skeletal muscle atrophy and this would predispose a patient to long bone fractures at a later stage. And what is very characteristic is that as this degeneration progresses, there is no myalgia or spasms. And so therefore, this condition is more or less painless. The creatine kinase can be up to 20 to 100 times the normal. As the respiratory muscles start getting involved, uh, there is an accumulation of the secretions and uh, there is a loss of pulmonary reserve. However, most of these symptoms are covert because at this stage, the child is unambulatory. And so therefore, the, you would not be able to pick up the signs of uh, weak respiratory muscles until they start developing complications. So like this person in the right, the, uh, at later stages, these patients are usually someone who is drowning in their own secretions. So uh, along with that, they, uh, you're going to have pharyngeal muscle weakness and nasal regurgitation, which uh, predisposes these patients to aspiration. And at the uh, last stages, you can have cardiomyopathy, which in turn would lead to <coughs> dilated cardiomyopathy. So as we can see here, it progresses through different stages. You have five uh, stages and uh, uh, anesthetic exposure usually tends to occur in the later stages. So stage three, they start having contractures so they can come to you for a contracture release. Stage four is where you have a stage of spinal deformity. So the patient is gonna come to you for spinal fusion. Stage five is where you have an end stage dependence where you have respiratory and cardiac complications which occurs more than 15 years of age. And at this stage, they're going to come to you for ventilatory support in the ICU. What are the diagnostic investigations which uh, we would like to see? So the first and most important is the serum creatinine kinase levels. The normal levels are usually less than 160 uh, units per liter. However, in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, as we discussed earlier, it progresses to more than 100 times the normal. So uh, you're looking at a serum creatinine kinase levels of around 15,000 to 30,000 international units per liter. However, uh, we should remember that there is no correlation between the serum creatinine kinase level with the disease severity. This is because as the uh, later, during the later stages, there is no muscle tissue for it to be replaced and therefore the creatinine kinase levels can plateau and subsequently fall. So it is very important for us as anesthesiologists to obtain a baseline value like we do for uh, the sugar levels in diabetics on the morning of surgery to uh, detect post-operative rhabdomyolysis. Other tests which, which can be used to uh, diagnose this disease are your lysosomal enzyme assays, DNA mutation analysis, and your EMG studies, which end up showing small polyphasic muscle motorulins. Another important uh, the diagnostic test would be your skeletal muscle biopsy. This is usually performed percutaneously in children, and open biopsies are preferred in older individuals. The muscles which are uh, preferred are the quadriceps, that is a vastus lateralis, or the rectus abdominis. 
And this is because these muscles tend to be involved early and they're not usually completely replaced by fat or fibrous tissue. So I've put up a, a slide of a histological slide of the uh, muscle in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So the one on the left shows your healthy muscle tissue and the one on the right shows your patient with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. What is important for us is uh, just like any biopsy, your, uh, I mean, uh, the local site should not be infiltrated with local anesthesia. So for all these patients, you would prefer a regional or a general anesthesia. Other uh, axillary investigations, you, you can have cardiopulmonary testing, which is important. You can have ECG changes. So like we see in this picture, you have tall R waves in your V1 leads and deep Q waves in the limb leads. Echocardiogram would show an LV dysfunction, uh, mitral regurgitation in the later stages due to pathology muscle dysfunction. Electrophysiological studies are important because some of these diseases, I've named three of them, uh, Emery Dreyfus syndrome, Steinart's disease, and uh, limb girdle dystrophies type one, wherein you have a risk of sudden malignant arrhythmias in sudden death. So uh, for these patients, you need to consider having an electrophysiological study as well. So the other investigations which are important for us as anesthesiologists, the most important is the lung function test. So the lung function test, we would be looking at the forced vital capacity and the forced expiratory volume which is uh, extensively studied in the supine and the seated position. So we shall be looking at it in the later slides. A forced vital capacity of less than 50% of the uh, expected level automatically predisposes the patient for an increased risk of post-operative ventilation and non-invasive ventilatory support. Blood gas analysis is also important for baseline PO2 and PCO2 levels. So the treatment... Uh, there is no curative treatment as of now. Most of the times we tend to buy time with either steroids and supportive management with non-invasive ventilation. So like this guy, for everything at all points of time uh, in later stages of your disease, you, you need to have the non-invasive ventilation mask on. Surgical support in the form of spinal fusion <clears throat> has come up, but again, it has controversial benefits. So therefore, for most issues, the only go-to therapies are steroids and non-invasive ventilation. The other muscular dystrophies, uh, such as your Becker's muscular dystrophy, which thankfully is, uh, it occurs later on. The onset is around five, after five years of age, and it is usually slowly progressive in comparison with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So the survival is actually better. They survive up to 30 to 60 years of age. Emery Dreyfus syndrome, again, your uh, uh, progression and the onset is a little later. The average life expectancy is around 46 years of age. What is important for us is that you have cardiac conduction involvement in Emery Dreyfus dystrophy. Other rare varieties of dystrophy, you can have the oculopharyngeal dystrophy, wherein you have ptosis and dysphagia as a predominant symptoms, facio scapulo humeral uh, dystrophies, wherein the skeletal muscles are usually involved and limb girdle muscle uh, dystrophy, wherein the cardiac rhythm disturbances are commonly seen in type one. So this is another slide which just compares uh, the three most common uh, dystrophies. So to summarize uh, the clinical uh, findings, irrespective of what is the cause or the name, you need to assess each muscle group involved individually. If there is a cardiorespiratory involvement, the patient tends to have a very high risk of post-operative ventilation and major adverse cardiac events. If there is a pharyngeal muscle involvement, there is a, uh, the patient is predisposed to a high risk of aspiration. Whenever you have a cardiac conduction disturbance, especially in your Emery Dreyfus, uh, Dreyfus syndrome and your limb girdle uh, muscle dystrophy type 1, you, you always have to assess the cardiac uh, conduction pathway in order to assess whether he needs an ICD or a pacemaker. So how do we anesthetize these patients? So where, where what are the uh, situations where they tend to have an anesthetic exposure? So like we discussed your uh, later stages, you can have a, uh, I mean, the earlier stages, you can have a muscle biopsy to diagnose them. During the later stages, you can have correction of orthopedic deformities. So you can have a percutaneous release of hip flexion or your contracture release surgeries, scoliosis correction surgeries. For uh, uh, syndromes which involve your conduction pathways, you can you, you may have to provide anesthesia for pacemakers or an intracardiac defibrillator. 
Diagnostic procedures can be uh, scheduled for these patients wherein you may have to take them for a CT scan or an MRI. And towards the end, uh, for providing uh, uh, supportive uh, care, you may have to anesthetize these patients for a tracheostomy or a gastrotomy or to provide mechanical ventilation in the ICU. So how do you work up these patients? We have, uh, uh, we have covered most of the points under your uh, diagnostic test. So what is important for us as anesthesiologists is that a basic basal uh, CTK level should be taken on the morning of surgery uh, and also need to perform a preoperative spirometry. Arterial blood gases should be taken before anesthetizing these patients, ideally, and electrophysiological studies for the syndromic patients which affect the conduction tissue. So let's look at uh, spirometry. So what happens with uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is that during the later stages, they tend to affect the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, and the accessory muscles of respiration. So uh, the chest tends to be bound in a corset, and this would lead to a restrictive pulmonary involvement. So there is a progressive decrease in the vital capacity and the total lung capacity, which predisposes these patients to atelectasis and respiratory failure later on. So uh, as, as, as anesthesiologists, we would like to take a blood and blood PCO2 and ETCO2 levels, especially if the saturation is less than 95% on room air. So what are the parameters which we need to look at? The first and the most important is the forced vital capacity, which has a very high predictive value in assessing the risk of respiratory complications. So this is usually measured with the patient in a seated upright position wherein a forced vital capacity of less than 50% predicted automatically predisposes the patient to an increased risk of respiratory complications. And if it drops to less than 30%, it just uh, pushes them into a high-risk category for post-operative respiratory complications. Next, we need to conduct tests to assess the respiratory muscle strength. So the most important are your maximum expirate, uh, expiratory pressures and your peak cough flow. So uh, these patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy tend to have what is called, what I would like to call a beanie cough. So uh, they have a very weak uh, respiratory muscle. So their cough is very ineffective. So <coughs> I'm sorry for that. <coughs> so your maximum expiratory flow uh, pressures of less than 60 centimeters of water would reflect an inability to generate an effective cough force. And therefore these patients would have a reduced clearance of respiratory secretions. And a peak cough flow of less than 270 liters per minute, wherein the normal is between 360 to 400, would increase the risk of post-operative post pulmonary complications. And if it drops to less than 160 liters per minute, uh, more often than not, uh, tracheostomy decannulation is going to be not possible. So how do you assess the risk? So you have all these systems which are getting involved. So your risk assessment plays a very important role prior to anesthetizing these patients. So every patient is different. The factors which need to be considered are the type of surgery, the clinical stage at which these patients present, and your cardiopulmonary involvement. So this is a useful scale that is a muscle impairment rating scale, which can be used to uh, assess what is the risk, what are the muscles which are involved. So as we can see here, whenever there is a proximal muscle uh, involvement, it automatically pushes them towards a higher uh, risk. So this slide shows that whenever, whenever we have, a, a, irrespective of what is the risk scoring of the patient, we have a high risk surgery, automatically the risk of post-operative pulmonary complications is much, much higher. So the anesthetic considerations, um, the preferred mode of administering anesthesia for these patients would be regional anesthesia. Uh, TIVA, if, if at all we were to administer general anesthesia, TIVA is considered to be safest. We need to avoid succinine choline. It is absolutely contraindicated because it causes rhabdomyolysis, it causes hyperkalemia, and it predisposes to ventricular fibrillation in these patients. Rhabdomyolysis is also seen with volatile agents, and therefore TIVA is considered to be safest. There is an increased risk of malignant hypothermia as well. These patients, most of these patients, like we discussed, since there is no curative therapy, most uh, steroids and NIV form the mainstay of treatment. And therefore, most of these patients are steroid dependent. And whenever you're expecting a large volume volume shifts, or if a patient has cardiomyopathy, you would want invasive monitoring as well. 
So these patients tend to have a rather, uh, uh, we tend to have a difficult time for extubation uh, of these patients, mainly because of a decreased cardiopulmonary reserve. And also they have a high risk of aspiration. Post-operative respiratory failure, like we discussed, whenever the peak cough flow is less than 270 liters per minute, or whenever your maximum expiratory pressure of less than 60, it predisposes them to post-operative respiratory failure. And uh, in syndromic patients, you also have a, a high risk of malignant perioperative arrhythmias. So it's important for us to prevent hypothermia because it tends to increase your incidence of myoclonic contractures and also increase your bleeding for these patients. So we say that regional anesthesia is what is preferred, but uh, what if you have to give a spinal or an epidural for this guy on the right? <coughs> so uh, uh, what we need to see is that the uh, landmarks are very deformed and as a result of which your ultrasound guidance is usually preferred in these patients. If you were to uh, administer general anesthesia, the rules to be remembered are that you would want to avoid uh, succinylcholine and volatile anesthetics because they increase the risk of hyperkalemia and rhabdomyolysis. So TBA is considered to be safest. And if there is cardiac involvement, even nitrous oxide is uh, ruled out. So the safe agents to be used, uh, which can be used are opioids, propofol, dexmedetomidine, ketamine, and local anesthetics. So what happens when you uh, administer volatile anesthetics in these patients? So when you have a Duchenne's muscular dystrophy patient who is exposed to volatile anesthetics, the, this increases the sarcolemal permeability. And so therefore there is a leakage of intracellular potassium and your creatinine kinase. And this would push them into a hypermetabolic compensatory response and would lead to a hyperthermic crisis. So what about depolarizing muscle agents? So what happens in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is that there is uh, <clears throat> an upregulation of your nicotinic alpha-7 ACHR isoform uh, isoforms of the nicotinic ACH receptors. So this isoform is more sensitive to succinylcholine and choline. And because it is more sensitive, it accounts for hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest, which uh, can be seen with the use of succinylcholine. And also these uh, nicotinic isoforms tend to have a lesser affinity for non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. <clears throat> so as we discussed, because they have lesser affinity, there is a marked difference in the onset and duration of action of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. So in general, they tend to have a longer uh, a delayed onset. They tend to have a longer duration of action. And also there is a higher risk of residual paralysis. So therefore, as anesthesiologists, we would uh, prefer to use continuous neuromuscular monitorings during your anesthetic uh, uh, during your anesthetic uh, stay. And these effects tend to be more pronounced with rocuronium and mevacuronium. So preoperative uh, preparation would involve a cardiac consultation in all cases, and ECG and an echo should be done. And however, a normal ECG or an echo does not rule out complications, especially in syndromic patients where the conduction pathway is involved. Preoperative training would involve your non-invasive positive pressure ventilation training for patients with a forced vital capacity of less than 50%. Manual and mechanically assisted cough when the peak cough flow is less than 270 liters per minute. And your dysphagia therapy, which mostly revolves around the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. What is interesting is that this non-invasive positive pressure ventilation also helps in optimizing nutrition in dystrophies. This is because your increased work of breathing, which occurs with uh, increasing respiratory muscle weakness, automatically predisposes these patients to malnutrition. And also most of these patients are unable to eat because of dyspnea. So use of non-invasive ventilation tends to help uh, mitigating some of these effects. And prior to anesthetic induction, anti-aspiration prophylaxis is also important. So monitoring is basically depending upon the risk of surgery, but in all cases, whenever you're administering general anesthesia, you would want a neuromuscular monitor. So anesthetic induction, the most commonly used agent is propofol. Thiopentone also may be used. And if you have a volatile scenario, you can also rely on ketamine or etomidate. Fentanyl and remifentanyl is used for analgesia. Airway challenges, 
like this man on the right, these patients tend to have a very big tongue. So uh, you have macroglossia and along with that, if there is a, a muscular involvement of the oropharyngeal muscles, the moment you administer your muscle relaxant, the uh, muscles tend to collapse and you may have a tough time mask ventilating these patients. And added to this, you have a limited mobility of the mandible and the cervical spine, which may in turn impede your airway maneuvers such as jaw thrust. So uh, most of the times it tends to prove to be a problem for extubating these patients rather than intubating these patients. So it tends to be a difficult extubation rather than a difficult intubation because as we discussed, you have a difficulty with swallowing. There is an elevated risk of aspiration and they tend to have a weak cough. So you have a accumulation of all your secretions. So uh, because of this, your nasogastric tube plays a very important part in securing the airway in these patients. Maintenance, usually TIVA is preferred uh, and uh, nitrous oxide is uh, was used previously. Warming blankets have to be used to prevent hypothermia because this tends to exacerbate contractures and also increase your bleeding. Fluids, usually <clears throat> glucose containing solutions are preferred because it lowers the risk of rhabdomyolysis and it also reduces the risk of hyperkalemia. So the use of potassium free crystalloids are preferred whenever possible. There are no absolute contraindications to the use of colloids. Blood transfusion, uh, they tend to have a higher requirement of blood products because there is an impaired plate, platelet function, an altered coagulation pathway, altered fibrinolysis, and also they tend to have a decreased blood vessel reactivity. So all stages of coagulation are affected. They also tend to have a higher blood loss during scoliosis surgeries. So how do you extubate these patients? You would want to have them fully reversed and fully awake like Jim Carrey. You'd, uh, you'd want to preferably, be, uh, preferably do it in the ICU because you have a ready-made uh, presence of non-invasive positive pressure ventilatory support. And it also tends to avoid an unsupported transport of these patients following extubation in the operation theater in clinically unstable conditions to the ICU. So the aim, for all these patients, if in case you're transporting them to the ICU with the endotracheal tube intact, would be to uh, wean them early and uh, uh, you know uh, put them on non-invasive ventilation as early as possible. And if at all there is any doubt, you would rather defer extubation for 20, 24 to 48 hours. Post-operatively, they have a very high risk of apnea and death following uh, extubation, and this risk can go on for 24 hours post-operatively. So you would want to monitor these patients intensively. Don't be in a hurry to shift these guys out of your post-operative care units, especially so if it is a major surgery and if there is severe muscle dysfunction. And you'd want to avoid prolonged immobilization in these patients if they are still ambulate. <clears throat> Post-operative analgesia is very important because adequate analgesia tends to prevent respiratory complications. And if at all the situation demands, you want to delay extubation in order to optimize analgesia. So these patients are more sensitive to opioids and we would want to have a multimodal way of uh, ana uh, giving analgesia for these patients. Preoperative complications which we need to look for most common are your respiratory failure and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, patients with syndromes affecting the conduction pathways, you need to always look out for arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. And other rare complications such as hyperkalemia, adrenal insufficiency, and uh, dantrolene resistant malignant hypothermia like reactions can also occur. Acute rhabdomyolysis. So what would happen if in, if in case uh, uh, you've taken all the precautions, there is still a risk of acute rhabdomyolysis in these patients. This is most commonly seen in children less than eight years of age, and it, it, it usually occurs in the post-operative period. So what would you do? You would end up discontinuing your inhalation anesthetic if in case you have been administering it. You would monitor the serum potassium levels and if, uh, and if it is more than 5.5 millimoles per liter, you would want to treat them with IV soda bicarb, calcium gluconate, 10% dextrose insulin, and hyperventilation to promote respiratory alkalosis. Serum plasma, uh, creatinine kinase levels, myoglobin and urine myoglobin levels have to be monitored. IV hydration should be given in order to ensure a urine output of more than 1 ml per kg per hour. 
surface cooling, of course, to reduce your hypothermic response. And this would be up to a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius. There is questionable benefit of uh, dantrolene in these kinds of scenarios. So now coming to specific challenges, what would I do if I have to sedate these patients? If these patients are coming in for a CT or an MRI where you don't have to secure the airway necessarily, or say if uh, they're coming in for a pacemaker implantation, so what would I do? So uh, you should always remember that these guys have a venomous tongue. Uh, you have macroglossia, so there is always a risk of losing airway patency. So uh, this, therefore, uh, you would want to do this uh, with an acceptable risk in early cases. And as much as possible, avoid going in with an unsecured airway in later stages. And like we discussed, this is because of pharyngeal muscle weakness, because of cardiopulmonary involvement, and there is a loss of ambulation. So you'd want to avoid doing this in your later stages. What would I use? I would use low dose ketamine and midazolam. And uh, we must always remember at the back of our mind when we have these patients, there is, a, uh, there is a tendency to lose your airway patency rather quickly. And <clears throat> so what happens if in case you have a difficult uh, IV access in children, like we saw the guy sitting, I would have a tough time securing his IV access. So what would I do in these kind of patients? It is said uh, there are, uh, I mean, uh, there are recommendations to this uh, extent that a short-lasting use of inhalation anesthetics is still acceptable. Sevoflurane can be used for short intervals, and the moment you secure your IV access, you need to switch over to TIVA or administering the regional anesthesia according to the anesthetic plan, and always be ready to treat acute rhabdomyolysis post-operatively. How would you extubate these patients? Uh, one thing is that extubation is delayed until your saturation reaches the baseline or it is normal and your respiratory secretions are well controlled. So as soon as you extubate these patients, you would want to shift them onto non-invasive ventilation. And this is especially so for patients who have a forced vital capacity of less than 50% of the predicted value and definitely indicated for patients with a forced vital capacity less than 30% of the predicted value. And whenever these patients have been on home uh, non-invasive support, you would automatically extubate these patients onto NIV. And wherever possible, you would want to use the patient's home interface. And post extubation, you need to have a cautious supplementation with oxygen. This is in order to avoid correcting hypoxemia without treating the underlying cause. <coughs> Sorry for that. Hypoxemia usually tends to occur in these patients because of airway secretions or because of hypoventilation or because of atelectasis. And you need to um, identify the cause before treating the, uh, before treating the hypoxemia. <coughs> <coughs> so your ICU concentrations, these patients may tend to end up in later stages where you need to provide uh, <coughs> supportive care. So for all of these patients, you would want to manually assist cough, preferably with a mechanical insufflation exsufflation device, especially when your peak cough flow rate is less than 270 or your <coughs> maximum expiratory pressure is less than 60. So the benefits of using this MIE machine are that it augments your cough and it prevents atelectasis using deep lung insufflation. Cardiology consultation is always preferred for uh, giving your goal-directed fluid therapy. Nasogastric tube can be used in patients with GI dysmotivity. So this is your cough assist maneuver. Is the video playing? Yes, sir, it's playing. So this is how you would assess the patient uh, for uh, augmenting his cough in the IC. This is one maneuver that is a supine <coughs> costophrenic cost assist maneuver. You also have a hemlick type of cost assist cough assist, if at all you were to be uh, 
handling these patients in the ICU. So you ask them to take a deep breath, place your palm in the uh, subcostal region, and then force down as he coughs. Lastly, your bowel management. So your aim would be to push it out because these patients tend to have gastric disc mobility. So whenever these patients uh, tend to have uh, gastrointestinal manifestations, you'd want a na nasogastric tube in situ to protect the airway. You'd want to give prokinetic uh, GI medications as well as gastroparesis is very common. Yeah, and important thing is that if oral feeding is delayed for more than 24 to 48 hours, you would consider parental feeding and um, if not, enteral feeding with a small diameter tube. So the other genetic uh, muscular disorders, this covered your muscular dystrophies. So what happens with your myotonias? <coughs> so myotonias are where you have a defective muscle relaxation. And uh, as a result of this, these guys, they are uh, like the dog on the right, hair on end. So most of the times their tone is increased. And uh, this usually occurs because of either chloride channel dysfunction or sodium channel dysfunction. <coughs> Sorry for that. <clears throat> so this uh, tends to happen because of uh, electrical instability of the muscle surface membrane, as a result of which the uh, muscles tend, muscle fibers tend to be hyper excitable. So they tend to have a prolonged time for relaxation after contraction. So you give a person a handshake and the person would still be holding your hand after you relax your grip. So that's how uh, myotonia is usually present. Different types, uh, may not need to know all of these. So what is important is that uh, these guys are persistently being electrocuted. So there is persistent depolarization and muscle contraction. This tends to occur, especially following mechanical stimulation of the muscle or following hypothermia or following shivering. <coughs> so in all these cases with uh, myotonia, your succinyl choline is contraindicated because because it is a depolarizing muscle relaxant, it can precipitate myotonic crisis. And uh, you can have a subsequent difficulty in ventilating and intubating these patients. So the duration of action of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, again, can be prolonged. And you need to avoid halogenated agents because these patients tend to be more susceptible for malignant hypothermia. Avoid anticholine-acholine uh, esterases when you're uh, reversing these patients because it tends to precipitate myotonic crisis. Next, we have myopathies. Myopathies are nothing but uh, uh, a replacement of your muscle fibers with other uh, tissue. <clears throat> so this can uh, be replaced with either lipids or with glycogen. So there is an accumulation of these abnormal substances in the sarcoplasm. Next is your mitochondrial myopathies, wherein we need to remember that the mitochondria are the main sites for electron transport chain and your oxidative phosphorylation. So this would result in a, uh, whenever you have a defect in your mitochondria, it would result in a defective ATP production. And this would affect your high energy dependent organs such as your brain, heart, and muscle. So the weakness typically tends to be associated with encephalopathy. So these are certain syndromes wherein you have uh, mitochondrial myopathies. So how would these patients present and what is our role as an anesthetist? What are our anesthetic considerations? So a lot of these patients have refractory epilepsy. They have a decreased respiratory and cardiac reserve with an impaired swallowing, which predisposes them to a risk of aspiration. They also tend to have an unusual sensitivity to intravenous and <clears throat> inhalation anesthetics. Propofol infusion syndrome has a strong association in these patients because propofol tends to inhibit beta oxidation in your handicapped mitochondria. So TIVA with propofol is avoided in mitochondrial myopathies. <coughs> also, you need to avoid lactated solutions because in most of these patients, you tend to have lactic acidosis. So this is a QR code 
those of you who are interested, who like the PowerPoint, can uh, scan this and uh, download your PowerPoints onto your phones or your iPads. <coughs> to summarize your anesthetic strategy, we need to remember that your risk stratification in the preoperative period is vital. The region anesthesia and TIVA is usually preferred in all the cases except in cases of mitochondrial myopathies. Succina and choline and volatile agents are absolutely contraindicated. And there is a low dose for a low threshold for post-operative non-invasive ventilation, especially when your forced vital capacity is less than 30%. <coughs> So before we wind up, uh, most of these patients, when you have a look at them, these are the three things which we need to remember. You have a bulked up sponge bob with a beanie cough and a venomous tongue. So that is what I would like you to uh, remember at the end of this presentation. And before we finish, uh, I have a particular liking towards the saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And we as anesthesiologists, I mean, we, we tend to control a lot of things in the operation theater. Uh, and our role has widened as a result of which we've been called as perioperative physicians now. So therefore, even though it is not acknowledged most times, we tend to control a lot of things which uh, directly you know, influence the outcome of your patient's take. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kausik. A nicely covered lecture. Thank you. Uh, you have proved yourself what I said in the introduction itself. You are the right person to present this uh, very tough topic. You have covered uh, all, almost all myotonias, myopathies, uh, my dystrophies. So you have done an extensive search in the journals. You have presented in the journal reference also. Thank you, Kausik. Thank you, sir. So, uh, whenever a uh, yeah, postgraduate see a case of muscular dystrophy or myotonia, the first thing they come in, the, in their mind is whether to use deep lowest muscle diacin or not even to put in muscle diacin. So, can you uh, yeah, consolidate and give you a capsule like what yeah, they have to do in muscular dystrophy, what they have to do in myotonia, like that? Can you give it as a capsule? So, muscular dystrophies. Uh, you need to, uh, these things are absolutely contraindicated. Scoline and volatile anesthetics are totally contraindicated. The same goes for myotonias, scoline and <coughs> scoline is contraindicated. TIVA tends to be uh, contraindicated in uh, cases of myotonia. So okay. you need to rely on uh, volatile agents for myotonia. Whereas for dystrophies, you go with TIVA and non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Thank you, Toshik. This is Thank my you. question. Uh, you said in the additional muscular dystrophy, it presents only up to two years. It yes. becomes symptomatic. Suppose we are uh, happen to give anesthesia before two years of age. Can, can we diagnose the uh, disease or you have to give anesthesia uh, similar to other patients? Uh, so before two years of age, you'd, you'd be looking at uh, conducting a muscle biopsy. That is where uh, most of the times you'd be anesthetizing these patients. So, suppose there, uh, we want to suspect the DMT. DMT. Sir? Suppose there is no symptoms, we want to suspect DMT. So in that case, yes, suppose we give anesthetics with a normal uh, pattern of anesthesia, will it land up in the complication? Uh, definitely, sir. In fact, uh, there was this article which was published wherein they were questioning the use of uh, succinyl choline in uh, pediatric patients because there is a very high risk of having these patients as uh, latent presenters. They don't have any symptoms. Uh, like you said, before two years of age, uh, you don't have uh, these patients presenting with symptoms. So you can always have these patients presenting for other associated uh, uh, surgeries and you tend to administer anesthesia for them. Unwittingly, if you tend to avoid, uh, if you administer succinyl choline, then you can have all of these complications. So therefore, as much as possible in the pediatric population, you would want to avoid securing the airway with succinyl choline. Yes. So that is the, uh, that is the uh, recommendation as far as the FDA goes as well. 
So uh, in all cases, uh, it is better to use neuromuscular monitor. Definitely. Okay, there is another question. So what are the tests you have to do for detecting rhabdomyolysis? You already mentioned the presentation. Yes, sir. Rhabdomyolysis, uh, you, you would be taking your serum uh, creatinine kinase levels and obviously they would be sky high. And along with that, uh, your urinary myoglobin, urinary myoglobin levels as well. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Kaushik. So today we have had a rare case presentation by rare landed peoples like uh, Swarna and Kaushik. I thank Swarna Madam and Kaushik for a wonderful presentation of rare topics. Many people uh, try to avoid these topics, but you uh, too boldly presented the topic extensively and for the benefit of the postgraduate. And uh, we are grateful to you both. Uh, Kaushik, can you share your slides because the PGs want to slide? Sure, sir. Uh, uh, I have given a QR code, so I can just share you that. Uh, scan that QR code. If possible, no, you will put it up again. Uh, okay. Those who want the uh, slides, please scan that QR code. One second, sir. Just bring it up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kaushik. It was very nice. Thank you, sir. So, so put up the QR code comment, slide. Super, sir. Any comment? It's a rare topic. It's difficult to read in the textbooks also. Uh, sir, are we able to see the QR code slide? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. We can take a screenshot of this QR code easily, sir. Yes, sir. You just need to open up your cam scanner uh, or your uh, camera and uh, scan this. So we are taking a different screen. Thank you so much, Kaushi. So Thank we you. come to the end of this session. So the, with that, uh, the pediatric analysis series ends up with, with this week. From uh, next week also, we will go on for pain medicine and uh, the left out regional anesthesia topics. I thank the Acrula and Evo Logics and Anesthesia TV for supporting this uh, online analysis platform. Thank you, Kausik. Thank you, Sona. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.